let me let me say two words about about what what we did uh, for the uh, president of Austria in Venice, which opened up last September and ran through uh, November. We were invited. I was invited to organize uh, the Austrian uh, pavilion in Venice. And w without going through all of the specifics, there were finally about 65 architects, some from Austria who were working outside of the country, some international architects who were working in the country, and then a group of people who were teaching outside of Austria who were Austrians, and a group of people who traveled to Austria to teach. So what's, what's I think, peculiar and in, in, and in, and in some ways, uh, uh, particularly for a country which is a small country and a, a kind of, I'm going to call it a second-rate country, but certainly a country which is not a world power, uh, notwithstanding a country that produces, and you know the list, it's a long list and it's repeated a lot, but there's sort of Wittgensteins and Schoenbergs and, and Neutras and Schindlers and Freuds and all of that. So, so Austria has a unique way of producing unusual intellectual types who over the course of hundreds of years have made an unusual contribution to the content of, of ideas in the world. The other thing which is odd is that, that many of those people escape or try to escape, try to get out, can't quite make it, and spend their lives going in and out of the country. This is an interesting tension between belonging and preferring not to belong and yet being not quite able to separate oneself. <coughs> so this is really the tradition of, of, of the arts in Austria that, that, that we made a substantial effort, I think, to subscribe to, to engage. And the people that are on the platform tonight are a small portion of the total. And these are people who had come into Austria to work and to teach and, and exhibited some of that work, which in, in some cases is their own work, and in some cases is a sharing between themselves and their students. So we might, we might start out by talking a little bit about the venue, the forum, what the opportunity meant for these architects, and then we can talk a little bit about how they responded to it. And then there's, there's another question, which is, which I think Hernan raised a few minutes ago when we were warming up for this, which has to do with the meaning of these kinds of exhibitions. Uh, who's involved, who benefits, what's learned. And what's happened over a period of 10, 15, 20 years to the Biennale, what does it mean? What does the, ex what does the exhibition mean? What value is there for the participants? What value is there for the audience? So I, I don't know, why don't we go down the line and we take a few people who, who want to comment a little bit on what the opportunity meant in the context of, of the intellectual world that really belongs for the last 100, 150 years to Austria? Um, I don't know if, um, <clears throat> if it's about Austria or for me it's more about the Biennale. And it's interesting when you start talking about Austria belonging or not, be that people belong or don't belong. Um, <clears throat> Architects have a, always have a tradition of wanting to belong to a certain kind of trend, right? I mean, we, I, I think we've talked, we discussed earlier about uh, why now there is no more surprise, and um, and I think that there's a little bit of of wanting to belong to what is currently a, a trend right now, uh, but. I think the Biennale in particular, at least for, 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 for me and, and I think for Craig, is really um, is, is, is a way for us to continue 
to do the work that we do and, and maybe put it out in a forum that could engage some other way of having a dialogue with other people. So it, it's, not, it's not about showing the work that you see here, that uh, the Biennale, you show work that, uh, that are not built, uh, have not been built, is, is, is not about that. But I think it's more about um, having the opportunity to ex expand on something that you may not have the opportunity to produce a, an, a, a piece. So it's not just about drawing, it's not about building something, but it's about having this, this chance to put it out there so that you could have other people, international colleague, friends, critic, put it out in a forum and have an open discussion about that. So I think that's a, a real opportunity. Well, I think for in, in, in some ways we, in, including this group and maybe some of you, look at SciArc as a venue and a serious venue for very critical discussions of issues in contemporary architecture. If SciArc's anything, it ought to produce those kinds of discussion, discussions. In, in that light, the question is, is the Biennale still a venue for a serious discussion of what architecture is or was or could be or should be? Is that the place to go find out about it? Or is that now <clears throat> passe and we have to find another way to have that discourse? Well, I would say it's not the only venue. Well, is it, is it a productive venue? <laughs> well, I think it's a productive venue, um, and I think Sark showed what we do uh, in a very different way than other schools. I mean, many schools were part of the Biennale, but they portray the work as academic work. It was a symposium during the day and it was a discussion about students' work. And I think SIARC participated in the discussion on a professional level and international level in terms of collaboration and cooperation with different schools, which I thought was an interesting way to, um, to say something about what the school does, which is, I think, is not only academics, but also is professional. In, in that way, I think that was interesting that created a friction in the process of, uh, of portraying what we do as well. It's not only about the school, but a set of relationships, a set of projects, a set of people all through the countries that are connected with the school and what we do, which I thought was quite interesting. I don't think Venice, the Venice Biennale is uh, the only venue, frankly, but I think it's still one of the... But it once, it once was. It once was, and I, I think, think it still I is, think. and I still think that people see that as one venue. And, and I don't think it's what you see surprising because you've seen it before or you might have seen it in other ways, but I still think it matters something to be part of it and uh, at that discussion. Well, well, what, is, what does the multiplication of biennales actually <laughs> tell us? I mean, for sure there are many biennales. It's like you make a house and you can see the ocean. If one window is good, are 10 better? In other words, is it better to have <laughs> one in Beijing and one in Buenos Aires and one in somewhere else. I mean, they, they have it now in Warsaw, the Biennale or something. They have it everywhere. I mean, does that reduce the, the, the impact of it? I mean, that would be an obvious conclusion. Yeah, I think, I know, I think it does. In, it, I, I do think that it reduces the impact, especially it would reduce the impact if, if uh, the, same, the same usual suspects are invited to all of those biennales, then it would reduce the impact. I think, I think, I think it's, it's, it is productive, and the, and, the, and the Biennale, the Venice Biennale, because when we talk about the Biennale, I only think about the Venice Biennale, that it is very, very productive when you exhibit something there, because, because in a way, you are, what, what you show, you're at stake. I mean, you really are putting yourself out there. You, you know, it, I think it would be unfortunate if one become uh, 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 jaded by that because, because we are talking about, and earlier we actually talked about how uh, we can see all of the work at the Biennale 
earlier and why do you need to go to Venice to see the work? The parties. Um, <coughs> so why what? do you? I mean, parties. <laughs> Yeah. No, but I mean, it, it, it is a kind of a joke uh, and the, the notion of the party, but it's about that idea is, uh, I don't know, a couple of two, three or four random thoughts, which are not necessarily connected, but I think it tried <coughs> to touch on some of the things that everybody's bringing up. One, um, I think I think what you were saying, that if the Venice Benali is passé, I would say, yes, that doesn't mean that it still is <coughs> not necessary or that it still is not interesting. Um, the re and, and I think it makes sense when you think about Venice itself as a city. I, I, I think I mentioned this in the opening there, which is uh, Venice is still like the wet dream for an architect, right? It's, it's one moment in history that political power, social structure, high level design come all together and became almost this almost dream city that every architect will we want the teach of the well, city. You know, you know what's odd about that? It's, a, it's such an anachronism. It is. It's such a piece of history, and how ephemeral are the new pieces, and how durable are the antiques. It is. But so what I, does that what tell would, you about the new pieces? What I would argue, I think the power of the Venice Biennale still have to do with the nature that is in Venice, and it's embed all that kind of memories and desires and ambition that any architect has. That's one thing. But I think also, uh, also though, I think the other, the other aspect about the Biennale, and I think maybe Alexis can speak to that a little bit more, is that it is in Venice and it is, it is impossible to build anything in Venice. Yeah. So the, the, the sheer effort, right, the sheer effort of bringing something there, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it awakens the palladio in you. It, 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 <laughs> that's right. Which is sometimes <laughs> it's better to keep it sleeping. Yeah, that's right. But you know, every now and then you actually get the chance to. Awakens palladio or awakens the adversarial relationship with palladio? I still find palladio pretty inspiring. You know, like it just, uh, and, uh, and especially now, now more, more than ever. Uh, when you go there, I mean, I think that the few of, of the things that they continue to be surprising, trip after trip mm -hmm. and biennale after biennale, it's like palladio is still there. And some of those things continue to be relevant. Uh, in a, just like a, a in, the, in the random thought category, I think the, the most radical thing that personally saw at the, at the Biennale with all this contemporary effort was Piranesi's work. Uh, and actually, somebody devoted to curating the largest Piranesi show in you know this side of you know 1950s. Uh, and I thought that that was actually a, a pretty interesting thing. It was sort of like a side chapter on the Biennale. Uh, it's not an argument for history, it's uh, actually an argument for ideas and kind of how it stretch over time. And, and I think that it just like if, it, if it was refreshing, it was refreshing because it didn't have sort of this anxiety of, of the new. Uh, it, it so you mean a Biennale is a reaction to the previous Biennale or forecast the next Biennale? Are you talking about the continuity from one to the other? No, I'm saying like there's like side, side events to the, to the, the Biennale is obviously a, a very complex event in, in its own right. I mean, you have the Giardini, you have the Arsenale, they're kind of separate worlds and administered in, in different ways. Also, you have like a series of events that are outside of the Biennale, such as the Piranesi show that was like across the canal. Uh, but at the same time, it's just like, it's like as a culture, I would actually talk about uh, the Biennale is a cultural event and kind of what does it mean to participate in one of those. And I think that the, the art Biennale is a little bit more clear in that, in that sense because it's like you have artists and you have people. People meaning that they're not artists, I mean it's just like... But there's a fundamental difference. The art Biennales are more like a trade show. So they still carry a certain kind of way because if you're an artist and you get invited there and so on, it changes your status in the field. The people who buy art goes there, yeah. museum right. director goes there. It's much more a trade show than architecture is in that sense. Well, I mean, so trade you know, show that's means it's commercial, commercial and has no intellectual content? No, it has intellectual content, but it's attached to a notion of commerce and the banal of architecture doesn't have it anymore. Or, well, it, first of all, it, it, it has but it's to do with the audience. I mean, yes. the Art Biennale, there is uh, an audience that might be interested in actually um, um, buying the, the material that is being exhibited there. I think the Venice Biennale has much more to do with an audience of architects. And I think, I mean, Ming's point in terms of uh, 
um, taking place in a city where it's not possible uh, to build. I think it's a very, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with that um, uh, because it allows for a level of experimentation that maybe in other cities there is a much more professional agenda that could be attached to that Biennale, that like people might be interested in maybe going beyond what, um, what the Biennale is doing by itself. But it's interesting for me that because of that, I think, because of Hernan's point uh, or because of the awareness of architects and curators of that point that, ar that architecture finales have been traditionally about architects talking to architects, you know, and architects talking to the discipline, have tried to raise the stakes and make it more about like either the city, you know, like the case of the uh, Ricky Bordet, the previous to the Aaron Betsky, or the architecture beyond buildings, you know, with Betsky were saying, you know, like if you have a lame person, you're like, you know, you could go there and see maybe what, what else architects can do, uh, or they supposedly meet people, which means that, you know, it's a clear uh, approach towards like bringing other means of communication in potentially like more direct forms. And I mean, what all this means, you know, is potentially a kind of loosen up with the uh, disciplinary means of communication and the kind of uh, bankrupt of the disciplinary means into like other forms of communication. Well, maybe, that that's, maybe that's an interesting point that, that when we were talking a few minutes ago <coughs> and looking back on, when did you say? 96, when, 96. when Holine, uh, uh, because I, I remember that one pretty well and I, I think that was a Biennale and what distinguished it, and I think it's different now, and Marcelo was talking about different means of discussion, a different means of communication, and in a way a different subject matter. And you could start to argue now that architecture, architecture, drawings, models in anticipation of making buildings, because everybody here didn't do that. Some people here did pieces of things, materiality, means of construction, some did buildings. But, but that you could argue that in a general sense, architecture seems to be inadequate as a subject, at least partially, that simply showing buildings that are coming along and haven't been done yet or have been built recently, which was once a reasonable topic and, an and a special topic, and a special topic because what you saw in Venice, you didn't see too much in New York or, L <coughs> or LA or Beijing or somewhere else. And, and that, that, in a way, what was odd about the Biennale was a odd insights and conceptual ideas that you didn't see everywhere. In some kind of watered down way, you now see, if not everywhere, more than you used to, which means the uniqueness of an idea and the presentation of that idea in the Biennale has lost its force. And therefore, somebody has to talk about another way to, to a way to replace it. Uh, Eric, let me, let me, let me uh, This is an odd position for architecture me, to be in when it says architecture is not sufficient. I, you know, I, I, uh, I had a great time. <laughs> I had a glad fabulous to hear it time. And, and I, you know, we had an incredible, uh, uh, host in uh, Alexis who would whip up uh, uh, spaghetti dinners and um, and there was a, a a really enjoyable sense of community I would say um, it's one of those few times when posturing was kind of not on everybody's agenda and um, prospering were, posturing posturing, <laughs> posturing. And, and, and there were, there were really, um, I think, very uh, uh, well-lubricated kind of um, dialogues among people. Uh, because it was, huh? Especially well-lubricated. Well, yeah, no, it's good that it was well-lubricated. And, and um, there was a, uh, you know, a sense of family that this, these people had all put such an extraordinary amount of effort yeah. into, uh, for me it was like going to a classic car show. 
where nobody gets anything out of restoring an old Rolls Royce, except their sort of pride of accomplishment. And, and, and I, I don't think you, 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 you ask for intellectual fulfillment when you go to a, a classic car show. You, 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 you're validated, your, your whole, um, you know, your life pursuit is validated by, regardless of how successful you are, by this sense that, that there are people out there who are earnestly and passionately putting their hearts into this stuff they're doing and sits there for a week. I think that's pretty profound. Um, I do think SciArc has, that's its core value also. So, you know, to that degree, um, you know, Venice and SciArc are kind of, uh, um, sisters, but I, it's, I've been to many, and it doesn't seem to me that intellectual content is something you can extract. I think it's maybe a, you know, a uh, red, what? Red herring. Red herring, yeah, red herring, not a blue one, or, yeah, red one, yeah. Anyway, that's. Well, but in a polemical way, aside from hanging out with your friends and sharing nouvelle cuisine, and, and commiserating with people who work as hard as you do. But if you step back from that, and that probably isn't the reason most people look at the work, and it's probably not the, the reason most people, when, when we had that discussion out in, out in front, there were a pile of people who showed up to what turned out to be, uh, I'm not sure it was a momentous discussion. It probably was the opposite. <laughs> but the context of that pavilion and the way it was done and its aspirations, I think, were somewhat different than what was generally done yeah. in that Biennale. Yeah, and I think there was different. some interest, if nothing else, in the opposition point of view, at least mm -hmm. for an afternoon. It's my, I think finally the police had to kick the people out of the Giardini because they were actually, actually so there was, there was a fair amount of interest in that. If, if you had to draw a conclusion about the content of architecture, the direction of architecture, after walking through that thing, what's the conclusion? I mean, what have we taught, what have we learned, what have we shown, what have we demonstrated, what have we done? Well, if that's directed to me, I saw like an incredible yeah, spectrum yeah. of stuff. I mean, there was humor in a lot of instances, which I, you know, for the most part, you don't see in our culture here, architectural humor. There was a lot of humor. There was kind of almost a boisterous uh, interactivity physically with some things. There was, uh, there were some extraordinarily refined, you know, kind of mechanistic things. There were. I mean, the spectrum was pretty incredible, I would think. Um, but what is, I guess the question is, what is that, I, I, I made the point, and I think this is really Marcello's point, that, that the idea of showing a building in anticipation of building it, drawings and models, or showing a building that should have gotten built and didn't, and I think you could largely see that over the years in Venice either what's coming and it's worth considering or what didn't get done but probably should have. But as buildings, but now you're looking at assemblies and techniques so that the scale of, or the ambition of the installation or the exhibition or the framework in which it's done is actually quite different. There's a much broader range. And I think the thing that Marcello did, the thing Alexis did, you wouldn't see in Venice even you go back three, four, five Biennales, you wouldn't see something like that. Hernan, too, for that matter. I, well, I think, I think, I think, I think first of all, uh, it's different. when you refer to the whole line, you know, curating, the, you know, direct, uh, directing the Biennale in 96, uh, I think the difference then and the difference now is that a building, which are being in the process of being designed, and 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 the, the, that anti uh, anticipation, if, if you see it at the Venice Biennale, is very different because it's uh, um, it's not as easily accessible then than now. Now every single project that is being anticipated, 
everybody know about it. I know, but right? if you go, if so, so I think so. So, but 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 so I think that the, the so that the Biennale now, the Venice Biennale now, is no longer that venue for those kind I of know, projects. I think because it, everybody I think it knows became about that. It. You know, like if, if you know, I had the chance to like have the the Aldo Rossi's and the Raymond Abraham's discussion. People that they were at the first and second Biennales, kind of, and, and kind of when the thing started, it wasn't about sh showing buildings. At all. I mean, it, show, it was about showing projects. It was about discussing architectural ideas. At that time, it wasn't about buildings at all. It actually was you know, talking about drawings and models and architectural principles, not necessarily a building or a show, an opportunity to showcase a building where it's built or not. Mm. I, think uh, the, I think the subject, I think what I'm saying is the subject is broader or it's more comprehensive. Mm. So the mm. definition mm. of the subject matter of architecture if you look back and you look through the catalogs and you see what's shown, and the definition now, I think there, there is an acceptable array of work at the moment, which is, in, in a sense, very piecemeal. I mean, you don't know what it means, necessarily. I mean, I could give you some examples. You look at projects which have to do with pieces of what, in the aggregate, if you put them all together, might amount to something you could understand as a building, now maybe another question, which is, which is a, a, a more profound question, which is, what's a building? And I, I think, uh, which, sure. which might have been accepted at least tacitly, and maybe is uh, up for grabs now. This is w yeah. what you uh, see in the, in the experimentation. I see. Oh, go ahead, sorry. This year, I took my students to this uh, expo yeah. at Shanghai, and it was interesting to see that I saw the Biennale in Venice where, you know, the model, I don't know if you're familiar, but I'm sure you are, is having all these pavilions uh, from each country. The pavilions didn't change for a long time, so they've been built, some very old, some no, newer, yeah, but uh, you really are not Can allowed to attach anything to the building. So what you show are either installations or small models. And then you go to Shanghai and you see that actually there is a huge effort from each country to build that kind of architecture. Yeah. And well, you no, see how architecture can, how certain architectural idea that has been maybe shown at the previous Biennale became real buildings, even if temporary buildings is about experimentation. <coughs> and I have to say, it was on one hand incredible that that was built, that there was so much effort towards this formalism, and that formalism was standing at the Shanghai Expo. On the other hand, also there is the craftsmanship and the problems of all these temporary pavilions, but then there is also the stillness then it's, it closes, a, it gives an end to a certain formalism, and it seems like that's the last of those expos. I think the expo, in a way, stole the show at the Biennale in many ways this year, especially in my opinion, because they proved that certain formalism for the past 10 years that haven't been built could be built uh, to, the, to the best of nowadays technology, whether or not we like that. And then I think it freezes this condition of architecture, whereas I think the Biennale this year opened a completely different discussion. It was not about form. I think Sejima was very clear. It was not about the, the usual suspects. It was not about formalism in certain, it was not about the big ones. Yeah. I thought but there was only one Toyoito buildings in the entire exhibition, and it looked foreign somehow. Mm -hmm. but we it was the only building from Japan. But I think, I think, I mean, I agree with that, but I think, Especially in this year, and especially in, in for us and in this panel, the Austrian pavilion was very, was very different at that level. And uh, actually, I think it was well, unfortunate that Eric had to leave, but uh, <laughs> that it was <laughs> said like that. You know, it's it was said in a little bit of like <laughs> <laughs> it was said in a bit of an opposition to you want, to, right? uh, to the kind of uh, trend of these uh, people and so on. I just wanted to make a point. Uh, because of maybe our pedagogic um, ethics and our responsibility as a teacher. And uh, you know, it was a little bit said in a, in a generous way as, uh, as in the pavilion, especially in the people that were like the, you know, the teaching in Vienna and in, in Austria somehow, the relation of the, of the work we do with our students and the work you know, that ultimately gets done maybe in our offices and what was exhibited there. You know, because I, I think, especially for, for Georgina and myself, and I think you know, obviously for quite a few, you know, not everyone here, it, would, it really worked that way. Like in terms of what you show, you know, if not the direct work of the students, which it happened in some cases, it's sort of synthesis of work. I mean, I see like people like Beans or I don't know, uh, other people here that you know, work in, arts, in, in seminars or people from UCLA in the case of Georgina and how that work potentially got synthesized through, you know, in our case, through these three objects. But 
I mean, I think that applies to, I don't know, you know, work of Hernan, where like, you know, even the work of his students who actually was populating these, these models. I thought as models of, you know, of production, you know, the, the, the venue was, was really interesting and, and, and more experimental, let's say. And even if you, you know, if you've seen things build like that or if you could build it like that, it's a certain reality and actuality to the, to the objects themselves, which was actually uh, well, I mean, I, I, I think I think it kind of goes back to the, you know, the the, the, the one, one of the first questions that that was asked, which has to do with whether uh, the Venice Biennale is a, a a venue for opportunity or not, mm. and 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 exactly, and I think that that's that's no, one of the thing that I think that that all of you I think yeah. to a certain extent did take that as a platform, right, to talk about something that is interesting for you to personally pursue at this point in time, and then to put it out there, and then to have some kind of reaction. At right? the end, the Vinales, or this particular, the Venice Vinale and so on, this, there are millions of communication, and I think any historical moment or, or any particular period of time, it have their own rules, and I think right now, as we were saying, 20 years ago, the Venice Biennale was, let's say, the flagship of, or, or, or the light that everybody would look about where the discipline is going. It had this kind of a secrecy and it was not so public. I mean, you don't have to go there or wait until the catalog. So they had this kind of a, almost like a magician convention feeling around it, which is a totally different one than today. The Biennale almost is like the Oscars. It's like the award season. There are like 20 of them on some moment. It became just one more. But that's been said. It's one of the things that we can be critical about that, but <laughs> if you don't get invited, you get really pissed off. But I mean, it's one of the things that if you're not there, it's still, hey, fuck, I mean, they're not part of the club. I'm not part of the, so they still have that notion of a part in a certain notion of tradition, which I think is important. Now, in relation to that, I think there are other things that we need to understand. We were talking about the media and communication. There are like many biennales, expos, blogs, virtual biennales, I mean, they, they happen every day on a day by day in, in, in the web. So the thing is, it's a, it's a different one. And, and, but that's, I think, but I think but we, I should, th we should think about, I, I think to me the problem has to do with the curatorial strategies. But I, but I also do, do think, and, 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 and this is why, uh, I, to me, this is more a fundamental question in terms of a saturation yeah. of exposure, meaning that if you have a Biennale in Beijing, Biennale in you know, Buenos Aires, Seville, a Biennale in Sevilla, a Biennale yeah. everywhere, um, then at the end, it's only about a showcase which goes back to just whatever you're currently working on and you just throw yeah. in something very quickly. I mean, I, I, I think that there is something fundamentally really, really important that the Biennale stood for at one point. It's funny that you mentioned the Oscar because the Oscar used to be interesting because it's selective and it's not four hours long and it doesn't give an Oscar to everybody. And then now the Biennale is a little bit like that. So what I wanted to ask, you know, in, from your point of view, it's not about being accepted or you, know, you get mm -hmm. pissed off that you're not being accepted. It has more to do with what is it at this time, you know, in terms of what, what does the Biennale represent, not well, purely from the curatorial to, point. It continues to be, I think uh, just to, to counter Elena a little bit, as, as usual. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think there's a fundamental difference between a, a Biennale and a World Expo. I mean, just like, there's like 150 years of, of World Expos, you know, the Eiffel Tower and, and, and all of those things, Chicago's and New York's and so on, that they are kind of like part of that history of inno countries innovating through architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Shanghai happens to be kind of one of them. Uh, I, and I think one thing that distinguishes the Biennale from other, I mean, what, what we were calling about the, the trade show, uh, uh, where you sort of go and display a product, is that it's an academic event. Uh, and I think kind of, and there's a collegial, I mean, uh, going back to, to what Craig was, was saying, and I think that he actually echoes something that only happens in Venice at a very particular time, which is like, architects talking to architects and it's just like, you know, we, we like to believe that we can pick up the cell phone and, and, and do it all the time, but 
that, you know, you have to kind of like create the place to do it. And as an academic event where like ideas are on the table and are, are there for discussion, you know, we're always going to be grilled at the Biennale. There's no other place in the world that they're going to give you shit as, as much as in the Biennale. You know, because it's just like that's kind of the toughest judgment and the toughest judges that you expect out of your work are going to be there. And, and I think that's kind of what makes it an interesting and relevant place from an academic uh, disciplinary point of view. Uh, and, and that sort of, I think it... it, it, yeah, it but, but that, I would say, going back to your point about the overexposure, I mean, you, like everything else, you can read it two ways. You can read it in a negative way or you can read it in a positive way. I mean, you can read it in a negative way or the overexposure, but also in a positive way, like everything else, like the music, film, television, whatever. Today, we live in much more fragmented culture. Like you have thousands of options about everything. So. I think it's about to recalibrate how we judge and how we look. And I, and I think, for me, there are more venues to more people to put their work out there. It's interesting. I mean, if you look at the, the Biennale from the 80s and the 90s, they were the same 20 guys every year after year. That started to broke in the 2000s and with the new mediums of communication, that started to broke and became a different thing, a different kind of generation, a much more mixed thing. That also established certain quality problems as well, and I think, but I think it's part, it's our obligation to recalibrate how we judge and how the work became of that, but it's not different than, let's say, in music in the 60s, it was easy to name the 10 or 20 relevant guys, the Stones, Beatles, Hendrix, whatever. Today you have thousands of people doing interest in music, and it, it requires another kind of thing, and it's a different kind of mm -hmm. logic, and I think everything started to work in relation to that with architecture. Yeah, well, I see that as an opportunity for more, for more ideas, then... And the Astro Pavilion in this particular case was pretty much a little bit like iTunes in that sense. I mean, which is kind of a weird country and so on. Sorry, Herwig. Uh, but what do you expect from a society that has been nurtured for years, at the end, everything about having sex with your mother or your father, which is what Freud established? But I think the idea that a country like that would pick Eric Moss, an architect from Los Angeles, to curate the show in which there were not that many Austrians at the end of the day to showcase, mm -hmm. to present the country. I think that's part of the contemporary culture that we live. 20 years ago, that will never happen. Exactly. Yeah. And and that in, 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 in a right. country pavilion, in a, in a Biennale, will be about to show Austria how international we are, how we are a center for the Bay, which it was a sort of a construction because it's not really that, like that. But that well, for I me mean, is absolutely symptomatic of the times that we are. Yeah, but which in a way, which in a way, the Austrian pavilion kind of broke that kind of boundary between yeah. this is the country, because go, going back to going back to the Venice Biennale, and 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 what really is uh, distinguished um, the Venice Biennale from any other places is that there has been that tradition that you actually have a pavilion for each country. And that, 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 that the, the tradition was that each country is being represented. So you go to the, you know, the Italian pavilion, you go, to, right, you go to the French pavilion, you go to the Austrian pavilion, and, and those pavilions has been designed and has been there and, has represent, and is in a quote unquote representing that country. So, so there's certain kind of nationalistic overtone behind that, which now, yeah. Is, 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 has kind of been broken down, which, which kind of brings you to the, you know, to the question of the monoculture of architecture that Craig was yeah. bringing up earlier, that, you know, is architecture a monoculture now? Is, it's like it's all the same everywhere. Well, maybe, maybe I can say something. Yes. Yeah, defend the Austria. The only Austrian representative mm -hmm. about it. Um, and um, I mean, I grew up close to Venice. It's like about two hours away. So I saw lots of biennales over the years and uh, lots of projects and, and, and contributions in the Austrian pavilion. And I found it interesting this year because uh, on, on the one hand, the Austrian pavilion was so odd to the, the, the rest of the theme, uh, which I thought that was kind of backwards, actually, the overall theme of the Biennale. But um, the Austin Pavilion, in a way, had like 64 architects. And, uh, and, um, and it kind of was a very good, uh, looking back, kind of like the last 20 years, like when, when uh, it kind of represent the kind of networks that happened in Austria over the last 20 years. And, and a lot of 
credit, I think, for these networks can be given to people like Briggs or Nova that in the, in the early 90s started bringing people to Austria, which at that point, uh, you know, had a art school, uh, the Applied Arts University, that was built on a 19th century model of, of, of teaching, which means it's a, it's a, a, a basically a apprenticeship kind of model. So you had one teacher, and you were with that teacher for five years. So when Pricks came in the in early 90s, he changed that, and he brought Moss, he brought Maine, and Levius Woods, and, and later a different generation of people, much younger, and that, uh, continued actually all the way to now. And so in a way, the, 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 although on the one hand, it was a mishmash of many different projects and so many uh, crowded in, in one tiny little pavilion, it was interesting to see kind of like a history over the past 20 years who, uh, you know, kind of went to Austria, taught there, was building stuff there, and that, that effort that, um, and that happened over that period of time. So for me, the whole idea about networking, although it wasn't really that, that the overall theme of the Biennale, was kind of very present in that, and I think very, very valuable in, in, in that regards. By the way, talking about country pavilions, more often than not, the American pavilion's pretty bad. I just want to say for the record, I'm kind of tired every time you go there, is the, the one with less imagination. Yep. I mean, I think the expo they have really to take it away too. from architectural record for ones that are all. There's one that has even less <laughs> the Argentinian. <laughs> well, we, we rent them from Uruguay. It's nowhere to be found. We, did, we didn't even have one. It belongs to Uruguay, an Argentinian rented. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but also, I mean, the fact that the Biennale, um, the Biennale keeps these um, um, different pavilions for each country, for me, has also to do with the fact that, uh, that it needs to. Um, keep a certain sense of democracy in the in the whole system, meaning that uh, I mean each pavilion can I mean has the freedom to develop or do whatever they want, while everything else is all, I mean always goes through the eyes of the curator, which I do believe that has a lot to do. I mean when when. Um, um, we were talking about uh, relevance or, or who's relevant for a certain Biennale, has a lot to do with who's creating it. So I don't think that, I mean, I think that the discussion is much more narrow. I don't think that, yeah, I think it, it'd be hard to be too general about um, the condition of the Biennale in, uh, within the contemporary um, discourse in architecture because it's, it, it relates to who's creating it. Every yeah, but there are certain yeah. facts about the, the, the redundancy that we have today, like, I mean, Literally, when I was a student, the Biennale was like a big deal. I don't think I'm, from our students, the Biennale is that big deal anymore. Well, any, because you were anymore. a student. <laughs> no, but for them it's not. Because it's true? one among many. For us, it was like the, was the thing. You know, it was, it was the one that you want to be part of it. Yeah. Today is one interesting. I don't say it's not the interesting anymore, but it's not the only one. I tell, I tell you this. It was the only one. No, but that's my point. The, the expo, the amount of people that visit the expo per day is almost a million. Even at, up to the end, I thought, no, no, because I think there's something to be said. And I thought, what are these people coming to see? Because I'm an architect, I'm bringing my students who are architects, and we're all looking at architecture, and there is absolutely nothing inside the pavilions. So these million people a day are looking at architecture. Maybe it's Asia, too. There are many well, people. But yeah. In the Biennale, after the parties, meaning after the conversation among the colleagues, I think you can find maybe, I don't know, 100 people a day I in the I would do survey a more table about all of us if we saw all the pavilions. I didn't. No. You were too busy hanging out and partying. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> so but at the end, it's about that <laughs> so the thing. I, mean, it's, uh, I got lost and got into the Brazilian one. Uh, that well, is actually I, mean, I, 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 I tried I to actually go on and you bump into somebody yeah. and then you're then having a coffee somewhere else. Uh, well, I, I actually I want to, 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 to kind of uh, maybe direct this conversation a little bit, uh, yeah. not just about what is the Venice Biennale, but I'm actually interested in, in you not talking about your project and why you present what you present at, at, at the Biennale as much as for you, what, uh, how do you see what you do and whether it is something that is um, I'm not. I don't want to say relevant, but 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 when you go to the Biennale and you and, and the work that you present and then what you see over there, how how do you how do you um, become critical about it, or do you think that 
it's just um, it's something that you, you, you wanted to bring back and then continue to pursue that. I mean, is there, is there something that, that by presenting your work at the Biennale change how you decide to do it's things? It's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm invited to the Biennale of Art this year yeah. in Venice, and I'm thinking, am I presenting <laughs> the same thing I present at the Biennale of Architecture? How am I changing my head? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know yet. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 guess, I guess the reason is because when you, uh, w once you presented the Biennale, you know, whether you have a chance to see all of the pavilion, but you actually are exposed to all, uh, you know, to every other country's, you know, all the architects' work. Some of them you know, some of them you already see on the internet. So in, 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 in a certain way, it's not, you, 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 you come away with a, Certain, uh, a certain set of information that make you not reconsider but put into, you know, put, put back into the way you're thinking about how, about, about your work. So, so, so that's why I wanted to ask you that question because I think that, that the venue for the Biennale for me is one which is you present what you are pursuing, but at the same time, sometimes there are lessons learned, or sometimes there are certain things that you want to consider. Mm. I mean, I think this is, I still see it as a, I mean, not that I've been like, to too many Biennales, and we've been to two of them, but it's still, I mean, a little bit of what Craig was saying. I mean, obviously, you know that you have to work really hard because you're going to be there with supposedly you know, not that all the best are there, but really good people, the best of the field, the best of the discipline. So uh, to me, what's interesting is like, you know, what are an architect or every architect does, given that you have to do something, what you decide to do and what you decide not to do, what sort of material palette. Like, I think it's a really important thing in a very small uh, space, you know, through objects or through an installation, you show, you know, the best of who you are or who you want to be or like or, or what your work is doing and and I think that's interesting. Uh, I do have to say that although you will think that because it's sort of an expert uh, show you will get a lot of feedback because of experts judging experts and exhibiting you know among experts but I guess you know the kind of collegiality and event and social aspects you know takes over a little bit and you you know like everyone's like hey you know great piece and so on and then uh, we all share that and, and then we go no. drink the leaves yeah, and, 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 and the reason why the reason but why okay but if you get a little bit of that the, 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 the reason why i'm asking this question for, for, for me for example if you if, if you take if you take the austrian pavilion okay you take the austrian pavilion and um what eric was doing in there was actually kind of pushing this thing which is large and it's sitting really uncomfortably in that space and uh, and then that's a way of reacting to a pavilion to a an architectural envelope and i and i think one of the things which is interesting to me about the venice biennale is is when you go there and you start looking at how different architects are um uh responding and reacting to the confine of the pavilion or how they they respond to the arsenal which is large you in know so so i mean i think it's more than just your personal work but i sure. also think that no, that ha that has something to do with the venue itself but right? it's very, but it's it's very fine, consistent but with that like if you mean like if you look at eric's work you know as an uh, as a curator in this particular case it's also i mean you could trace a parallel to you know to his own work for sure and i think that happens i mean uh, that's what to me is interesting, and you know, and it's, it's that venue where, let's say, you you get to exchange those ideas through just like you know having the work there that that speaks to other works and uh, and has discussions and so on. I'm not my point. I don't know. 
I don't think those discussions happen so much, you know, in, among the, the exhibitors. I think they just happen, well, they're, they're, in, they're inherent there, they're latent, let's say. I think it's important to also say that they're choosing, I mean, we're like more like guests of the Austrian pavilions that invited to the Venice Minale, which is, I, and that's more of our position. So in that sense, Ming, I mean, I think that also there's like, there's enough, you have to show the work in a certain place that belongs there. I don't think that any of us actually gonna like show a project comprehensively, like uh, in such a way that we can actually kind of like get a little bit more of in depth. Uh, I think that the question, I, I hadn't thought about that. It's just like kind of what, how do you contextualize your own work and so on? You, you can definitely mm -hmm. do that. But at the same time, I thought that this particular exhibition uh, it had to do with some other ideas, and I, I thought that the overall idea uh, and, and kind of showing this sort of like piecemeal approach and, and very limited information. It's like today, we're talking about projects that you guys can see. I mean, right? It's just like if you're lucky enough, we, we can walk up to the library and see kind of what what we what we showed. But I think just like the exhibition was a little bit that way too. I mean, just like only show so much uh, or so little of, of the project, and that's about enough. Well, I think cert certain other parts of the Biennale were just like, they're a little bit more at risk. I don't think that we were like particularly at risk. No, in but I think, I think the context of each exhibition, how you get invited, like uh, in the 2004 Biennale, which was the first one I was invited, I was invited to be in the Arsenale and the Italian mm -hmm. Pavilion. <coughs> um, but in both of them, they told me specifically what project they want, and they told me exactly how many drawings and how many models. Like it was basically, we want this, just send it to us. That's it. With Eric, it was more like, you are selected, but he didn't tell me which project. He said, show what you want to do, something have to do with your interaction with BN and so on. So then you start to put that in motion. So the context <coughs> is different. One, is, one thing is when you get selected, when the project gets selected, another is when you as an individual, your practice or your teaching gets selected, and, it, and then you have to come with some sort of an idea. And then you try to figure it out who will be next and whatever and so on. But in terms of the reaction of the critical, so the context, how you react to that, to me is very different. And it's different when you exhibit in a group show in a museum, and particularly when you exhibit in a solo show in a museum. So each of the context is different. But my, rea my reaction with, the, with this one and the previous, and pretty much, and we talk with Marcelo uh, to our lives a lot about this, and it's similar <laughs> than I have with competition. My reaction is always the same. I always go and see. And I start to think, how I can be so stupid? Don't think that. Like, I always think everybody else have much clever, simpler idea how to execute that. And we always go into a very complicated way to think. So I always, my reaction is that one. And then I go back and I keep doing what I'm doing. So there's a criticality. No, but my point is, there's a certain criticality for a moment. But then at the end, you do what you do. And there's no way around that. To me, it's always interesting because my reaction is always that. Every time I, I'm in a group show and go and say, and we spend hours doing this and that, and somebody goes and put, like the guy who did the thing with the wires, right? The in, nothing in the arsenal, yeah. <laughs> I said, wow, that's clever as hell. So the criticality for me is a very temporal one. You only mm -hmm. have like in that moment, and then you start to feel, I don't know, my reaction is always, you walk into the show, mm -hmm. you hate what you did. Then the day after you come back and say, well, it's not so bad. And by the third day, ah, actually it's pretty good. And you go back home in peace. You know, uh, I think that's to me, it's the, at least it's a psychological mechanism, but sure. so my critical is not that high. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's, you know, I think what you're describing is, is probably what every single participant goes through. There's a challenge, you, you try to devise a strategy. The work of trying to devise a strategy makes, creates a kind of framework in which you're trying to assess what people are up to and what the whole field is about. It's an internal dialogue that you're having. And it's then you test it. And it's like a Petri dish, you know, you're one of the uh, bacteria kind of swimming around in there and trying to find some, you know, something to spit, share spit with in a way. And, and uh, you know, and then you learn something internally, yeah. just like you're saying from that experience. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the value. Now that you talk about that, it, I still have like blood in my eye because like this guy, the, the, the Japanese guy that did this house with elements that were, and you know, I, I kind of pride myself like I'm interested in nothingness, you know, like how close you can get to it, how thin material should remember, be. This guy, I was like working with one inch pipes, I thought like that was the best. I go there, this guy has like an eighth of an inch pipe. 
I mean, that guy is just like, it's still like, you know, ahead but, of me, but, but like, Hold on, hold on. Miles. This is a typical Vinal moment. We bump into each other and you say, you see the work of the nothing in Japanese? And I told him, yeah, I fucking hate it. You say, I fucking love it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a typical Vinal moment. Yeah. Like, I fucking hate it. I mean, the guy didn't do shit. No effort. And he said, ah, I love that. <laughs> And that's how we go. You can't do something that like a dog can, you know, can like throw it out, you know, that it oh, actually fell cat, down because a of it. Oh, cat. a cat. Okay. Even worse, you know. And get, get the prize. That would <laughs> piss me off. So there is still some criticality in, at the Venice sure. Biennale. I mean, there's, there's people out there better, doing better than what we do, and, and that no, kind of gives us... Unfortunately, Eric, we're, like, we're still the best. Talking we about criticality, <laughs> there was something, something really funny. I mean, uh, and I want to say this for the record, so I, I have no problem that we tell Eric about this. In this opening, there was a discussion. So it was Priggs, Tom Main, Nobel, and Eric, and me too. And it was basically, in different levels, everybody bashing the Arsenale and Sejima. So the day after, they give the Golden Lions and the Bronze Lion, whatever, and Eric was completely pissed off that the Austrian family didn't get it. And I said, but man, yesterday, you were trashing the whole jury. How do you expect them to come to? So the criticality is a funny thing, because we all praise that we want to be critical, but it's no way if you're critical that that's not going to backfire. So this, uh, uh, to me, the whole thing about that, how much you push for the argument, how much you, uh, at the end of the day, the critical is, 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 is a very difficult thing because you, you look into the, cri the crystal and you see it, your world. Mm -hmm. And there's no way, I mean, like, the whole thing about Sejima, I always find it peculiar because it was all about people meet people, architecture without authors and all that. And the first thing that you see in the Biennale is a one-hour documentary by Bim Benders about Sejima. So she's claiming that it's all about not architects. And the first thing that you see is a celebration of her as a great, amazing architect walking in her building, which is, t I'm totally fine with that. But there's all these things that is, is kind of a, how it really works? And a lot of people, and all their critics bought it. And they were glowing about that, the architects without architects, without architects and all that. And I said, I I'm the only one seeing this. So it's a tricky thing how you read those things because not at the end of the day you see the world in the way that you see it and there's not there's no way around that. Let me just uh, just to maybe cap it off, but uh, uh, my, let me express my, my my respect for the Austrian government and the Austrian pavilion in particular. Uh, I mean, uh, also I mean we were invited to exhibit there because like two or three years ago, like three or four of us had the chance to go and work in Austria and bring like a dozen of the students from Syrac with all trip and hotels and it's all paid by the government of Austria to go there and kind of like get learn something uh, about some of the architecture over there. Uh, and I thought that, you know, just like there's not many places in the world that actually do that. Uh, and now that this is like the post Nover uh, um, era, it's just like, I don't know, I'm not so sure that these things are con gonna continue to be that way. But uh, but I think it's just a kind of this a remarkable effort from uh, uh, whether we like it or not or we'll get criticized or not. I think that uh, I, I really respected that and Venice Vinali or not, I thought that the, the it was a pretty interesting uh, situation and, and 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 very generous opportunity and it wasn't the first time. Uh, so I'm just gonna go on the record saying that uh, go Austria. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I love Austria. <laughs> um, Questions or emails? Uh, yeah. Yes. Is there any? Uh, since we, since uh, we purposely, I mean, none, so none of the panelists the really yeah, discuss yeah, the work that they present <laughs> at the Biennale. Um, now I wanted to open the floor and ask if anybody wanted to ask us question about what we exhibited at the Biennale or about what we have been discussing. Be careful what you say because I think we have more than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I, think, I, think, I think we can take you out. That, I mean, in, in it, 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 it just means that whatever is, is exhibited up in the library is so crystal clear that um, doesn't need any explanation. Great. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you.